Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Next. I am your host, Mike Walker, and today we're going to continue on that theme of looking at all the innovation that is being distilled around bourbon. Yeah, let's 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 go with that. Um, so we're looking at innovation around this passion of mine and my close ne network of friends. Uh, so this is something we want to dig deeper in. And so in this episode, what we're doing is we're going to talk to uh, the co-founder of a startup uh, in Silicon Valley uh, called Endless West. And Alec Lee, he is the co-founder of this company, and they are making whiskey at a molecular level. And so his company, Endless West, has built, or not built, has created this product called Glyph which is pretty darn cool. So what they're able to do is they're able to compress the time period down from four or more years down to 24 hours to create this bottle of whiskey. So we're going to go through why did he decide to do this? Why are they called a tech company when they're making whiskey? What's going on there? And why is this really, really different and special? We want to go deeper into how he is harvesting ingredients to be able to create something that tastes like the real thing, but in a fraction of the time. So like with all of our episodes, all the show notes, links, uh, all that stuff is going to be on vnextpod.com. That's vnextpod.com. And also, you know, if you like what you're listening to, you know, like this video, subscribe to the channel. So you stay up to date on all the interesting and kind of out of this world things that we like to talk about on the podcast. So with that, let's let's jump into it. Cool. Alec, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So Alec, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to sit down with me today. Um, uh, as our audience knows, you may or may not know, we talk about innovation and looking at all the different ways that it's being applied uh, around the world. And I ran across uh, your guys's molecular science-driven whiskey because, uh, you know, I, I love bourbons and whiskey. So I was like, hey, I've got to I got to check this out. And so I'm glad that you decided to uh, to join me to talk more about this. And as we dive in, it'd be good to understand a little bit more about you and what you're doing at Endless West, what's your role, how did you get here, all that great stuff. Sure. So uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Endless West. We started about five years ago now. Um, and I have a biotech background as, as well as my, my co-founder. Uh, but it always been in the startup space ever since uh, I started my first company in college. This ended up becoming the the third company that that I became a part of, and I'd always kind of wanted to do something in in the food space. Um, and I guess kind of in the 2012 2013 kind of uh, kind of timeline, just as people started to really work on this sort of next generation of food, is when I started thinking about kind of like where, where else could we play in this space? And, and of course, you know, the, the stories of Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat um, have kind of blown up for even mass consumers. And I think a lot of this, this tidal wave shift in consumer perception around what technology and food can do um, is, is really helping, uh, in this case, it's a rising, rising tide lifting all boats, right? It, it's that there's a lot more companies going into this space Consumers are a lot more open to it. And I think people are starting to be a lot less afraid of the implications of engineered foods compared to how they were uh, previously, maybe even 15 years ago, uh, especially with this big drive towards like clean label, organic, you know, whole food kind of, uh, kind of movement. And really this recognition that those things are great, but they're not really going to be enough to solve a lot of the growing uh, supply chain problems of food, the sustainability challenges uh, of, our, of our food system with a growing population. Uh, and that like any technology, uh, you can use it for evil or you can use it for good. And a lot of the companies coming into this space these days really are trying to do, to do good with that technology. 
So we, we had wanted to explore in this space, uh, but really kind of outside of the commodity food product segment. So we were really interested in where are the really high performance, really high value applications for, uh, for these kinds of technologies. And alcohol seemed like a really unique place for us to do that. So MS West became really the first company to do what we call molecular wines and spirits that we create note by note uh, without any fermentation or, or aging. Um, and, and so this, this process really allows us to dramatically reduce the amount of water required, uh, the total land use required to create all of those raw materials uh, that go into that final product. And of course, actually reduce dramatically the amount of time um, and, and the cost of, of these products and, and make really high quality products much more, much more accessible. And so we wanted to really solve kind of these two problems at the same time of being able to make things that are more sustainable and make them more accessible at the same time, as opposed to having to come out with products that really are, are kind of like luxury, uh, really only for first, uh, for, for early adopters that, that they can afford them uh, in, in those early days. Uh, but we're now getting to this inflection point where we can really make truly mass market affordable products, uh, but also just do them sustainably and, and deliver to the market really quickly. So this, uh, this is awesome. And I, and you touched on so many really, really great points. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and so if I, if I get you right, um, so you're, we're running to focus on an area of the market that, that you could see growth differentiation. And I tell you, picking the year of 2020 for anything related to alcohol, that's a home run. Um, (laughs) um, but, uh, that aside, um, so why did you pick, you know, whiskeys and in those sorts of spirits? Were there any particular reasons? Was, it, was there a passion around that space or an interesting story? You know, we we originally were called Ava Winery, uh, and the inspiration for the company was my co-founder was at a Napa Valley winery, and he saw this very famous vintage of uh, wine on the wall uh, that won this competition in 1976 called the, uh, that later came to be known as the Judgment of Paris. And there's only a handful of these bottles left in the world. Pretty much nobody knows what this stuff tastes like anymore. Uh, and they have this they have this one bottle in the whole winery behind this plexiglass case, pretty much just on display. And he's like, can I, can I try that? And of course they're like, no, <laughs> this, is our, this is our last bottle. We're not opening it. Uh, you can't even find these really at auction anymore. And they're like, the last one sold five years ago for like over ten thousand dollars, and he is sort of coming back uh, from the trip, being like, "What a shame is it that it this this pivotal moment in in the wine industry, where suddenly you know uh, we we recognize globally that great wine could be made outside of the old world of France and and Italy." Um, then no one really even knows what this tastes like. Uh, but if you take away the history and the marketing and, and the story of all of that stuff, if you set that aside for a second, it's a glass bottle with mostly water and some alcohol and a bunch of other molecules in it, sugars, acids, you know, flavor components, color, et cetera. And all of those things are some quantifiable molecule. And if we could figure out what those molecules are and source them from other places in nature, we should be able to make this thing back again, sort of, you know, like an image pixel by pixel, in this case, molecule by molecule. So we started out trying to, to think about whether we could make these uh, famous vintages of wine uh, and, and make them more accessible for people. But there's a lot of, uh, as, as you may know, in, in the alcohol space, there's a lot of like really interesting, uh, very old uh, regulatory structures in place, yeah. distribution structures in place. Um, and so, you know, we, we really have to exist inside of a, of a framework that has been around for the last 80 years, isn't necessarily uh, as flexible as pretty much any other framework. We have a lot of, uh, we have an alcohol lawyer who, for, who told us once, he was like, look, alcohol in this country is more regulated than guns. Yeah. Um, and now whether that says more about alcohol than it does about guns, you know, r- remains to be seen. But the, the point is still, it's very, very difficult to, uh, you, to, to do business in this space. 
And so we still have to really work within the confines of that framework. And we realized over the, over the next couple of years that whiskey made a ton of sense for us a lot for, for a lot of regulatory reasons. Um, and, and within the technology framework, it still made a lot of sense from, from the perspective of it's a really long lead time to make it. There's, there's supply chain issues with it. There's quality issues with it. Uh, and, so, and, and so there's a lot of features of wine in the sense also that from a social perspective, it very much has a sense of place. Uh, it has a sense of history. Uh, and, and people expect really high performance from that product. You know, you know what great whiskey is, and you also know what really bad whiskey is. Um, and, and so there, there was a confluence uh, or, or convergence, if you will, of those key factors for us from a regulatory framework, from an economic framework, from a technology framework. And so whiskey made a lot of sense. That does make sense. And um, uh, I, I agree. There's there's interesting laws on the books. And I noticed, and I've got a, a, a bottle of your uh, whiskey here now. Nice. Um, Love it. It says spirit whiskey with natural flavors. I, I looked at that language. I'm yes. like, okay, I get it. Uh, I, I see what's going on here. Um, because you've got to, like you said, you've got to fit within kind of this legal definition of what a whiskey is. And, you know, you know, I, I favor, uh, bourbons and bourbons as the, you know, uh, as you know, even more regulated around, uh, yeah. the process and all that and where it can be distilled and all that great stuff. So, uh, it's, it, it's certainly a fascinating thing, but also I think how some people look at this is it's kind of a, uh, a kind of like a tradition type of thing, right. Where, sure. um, you know, it's our nation's only, uh, you know, spirit, or, you know, that, that we can say originated from America. So there's a bit of that historical legacy, I think, that people kind of gravitate yeah. towards. But outside of that, you know, you really can't say anything else. But I want to double click on a, on a couple things that you said, because I think it's really important. And sure. uh, some people that I've talked to have referred to this type of process, and they've said words like synthetic. And I don't, yeah. if I understand you correctly, and correct me where I'm off base here, but we're not talking about engineering chemicals to replicate what something is. We're not talking about a Star Trek replicator that's, you know, taking things out of thin air and replicating it into something new. So it's not engineered. It's not kind of, you know, assembled from inert things. This is something where you're kind of harvesting from existing things. Is that right? And if it is right or wrong, kind of help me understand a little bit more about that. So kind of demystify this a bit. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, what, what, the way that I describe it is like, we're not making a, a functional analog the way that let's say an artificial sweetener, let's say aspartame is a functional analog of sugar where it's not sugar, but it elicits the same response. And so it gives you the feeling that, that it is sugar. Um, so our whiskey isn't like that, where it's something that is, it's some concoction that's not whiskey, but it's just something that tricks your brain. Uh, it tricks your tongue and your, and your olfactory senses into thinking that, it, that it's whiskey. So what we've done is we sort of map the molecular profile, you know, all of those molecules that actually contribute to the, uh, the essence of, of what whiskey is. And then we go out and we, Find plants, you know, yeast, fruits, vegetables, all kinds of other, uh, you know, sources of nature, and we can extract those individual components. Uh, and in fact, there is even some wood extraction, uh, also from from oak. So it's not that we don't use any of this traditional uh, components or, or ingredients. In fact, uh, of that in that bottle that you that you held up, all of that color is actually directly extracted from wood. There's no caramel coloring like you find in a lot of whiskeys out in the market. Uh, there's no artificial coloring of any kind. It's straight up 100% wood. Um, but we're able to get those things out overnight, as opposed to having to age them over 20 years. So the molecular composition ultimately ends up being, uh, you know, definably whiskey, mm -hmm. with no, you know, synthetic or artificial components that we're adding in order to mimic or, or elicit some trickery 
that makes you think it's it's whiskey. And so even that that distinction of spirit whiskey with natural flavors, you know, that's something that the federal government uh, has designated us to be. But at a you know, we we of course wanted to be able to call it something like molecular whiskey that doesn't exist as a category within the legal framework. But from a molecular perspective, it is whiskey, um, and and that that I think is is uniquely different from uh, how a artificial food or, or beverage, you know, color, uh, sweetener, how a synthetic product is understood to be, which is, it is literally some novel chemical, some novel component that has never existed before that we just happen to get the FDA to approve. Uh, that is not what this is at all. These are, you know, you could think about this as glorified tinctures in some sense where, you know, instead of having just these crude extracts, we just take it a couple steps further to purify those individual molecules that were that were specifically looking for. Interesting. And so, you know, if I repeat what you said, kind of in my own words, so this arguably could be more pure, and uh, than you know what we see with other whiskeys, because you control end to end the entire process, the ingredients that go in. There is very very little variability in the process. Uh, is is what I'm understanding. I think there, there definitely is an argument to be made on the purity side of things, um, if only because things like the addition of caramel color, which right. is commonplace in the industry, is something that, that through the efforts of lobbying over the last uh, few decades, you know, uh, whiskey manufacturers don't have to place on the label. And so there's, I think there's, there's very much a, a misconception about how quote unquote traditional whiskey is even made today at all. And what kind of modification is in fact allowed without any labeling or without any disclosure. Um, and, and so I would, I would place that to the side of, you know, there, there is uh, arguably at best some, some lightweight consumer deception uh, that, that, is, that is commonplace in the industry. But even if you look within the context of what is traditional whiskey and assume that you have a bottle of, of whiskey that is truly traditionally made. I think you have to ask this sort of like futurism, you know, uh, philosophical technology question of, you know, is whiskey a process or is it uh, a product? And if you, and if we fundamentally believe that whiskey is the thing that you end up with is, is the combination of the molecules of that thing and that it's process agnostic, well, then the thing that we make is whiskey. It is indistinguishable from whiskey. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And um, how I go back to kind of the standard analogy of uh, mus the, mu the music industry. So, you know, you used to have record stores and all that, and they were very specialized. There was a cultural element around it, et cetera. And then iTunes came, right, and yeah. dominated the industry. You know, I look yeah. at, and maybe it's a fair or unfair uh, analogy, you tell me, but I look at what you're doing as a way to essentially be able to make a more sustainable product, uh, perhaps even better quality from a chemical perspective, from a, a organic perspective, et cetera. It's definitely more controlled than, you know, uh, leaving it up to nature and, you know, some of the other variabilities that go into it. Um, but this is something that you can mass produce easily or easier than, you know, let's say the traditional old rec record store. Now there's always a, in my opinion, there's going to always be a place for that record store and libraries of books and all that great stuff, because yeah. maybe you want that variability. Maybe you want that character where, you know, not, I mean, technically not every, you know, whiskey is the same because, when it's stored in the warehouse, it's in different places in the warehouse. It's aged differently. Maybe some gets more sunlight, some doesn't, you know, temperature variations, all that great stuff. You know, the connoisseurs, you know, people outside of myself will recognize that. I probably won't ever recognize it, to be very honest with you. Sure. Uh, but I think there's always going to be a place for that. But this looks to me like the future. You know, I, I really like that analogy, and, and I'd actually take it kind of a step further and kind of bifurcate it uh, in, in some sense. There's like this electronic music element of, of what we're doing where, you know, to your point, there's this hyper-traditional way of thinking how music has to be made and, and how whiskey has to be made 
because for generations, you know, you have to use a physical instrument, whether it's a, a woodwind or brass instrument or whatever. And someone not too long ago comes along and says, I've got this thing called a computer. It has speakers. I could make my own music. I can copy music or record music that someone has made and I can then, and this is where sort of the bifurcation happens, I can go in the one direction and really just change the game on what distribution means right. for music and make it accessible. Make these things that we would otherwise have to go to a concert for and be some bougie rich person uh, to, to go do. Now anyone can listen to really anything anywhere in the world. Um, and on the other side, you can make novel forms of this art you know music is a form of art right and i think there's a lot of distillers out there who also view this you know we call it craft for a reason who also view it as a form of of art and, and a form of personal expression and so i think in, in also in the same way that the industry ends up looking different post digitization of music but it doesn't fundamentally change our experience of the fact that we want to see novel creativity. We want to see where human engagement is central to the experience of that product, whether it is made um, with a, an actual physical piano or whether it's made with a synthesizer. Um, and so in, along a similar vein, I think that, again, to your point, there will always be people who will want the experience of the traditionally aged, uh, the traditionally aged spirit. But I think there's also a place where spirits made in this way, these molecular spirits that can make really high quality product accessible to, to the masses, uh, that has changed the, the nature of distribution and access to high quality products, um, and can also create novel expressions that have never been made before, that those things are, are inherently valuable. And, and our process, really is no less human than, uh, than the creation of digital music. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature, or, or for that matter, no less human than traditional forms of whiskey making. It's just that the nature of that craft looks different, um, but it's still very much human-centric and human, human design. And I think that's the really important part for, for people. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. Uh, so I went on your website and I saw that you guys describe your company as a technology company that yeah. makes spirits. So that was interesting, right? There, there's, uh, you know, I don't think you could go on the other kind of major labels and see kind of that type of language. What sure. kind of drove you guys to thinking that way, and and why do you guys see yourselves as more of a technology company? So I actually, I, I think it's really interesting that, that you bring that up because um, for, for a time, if you went on uh, the McAllen website, and of course, you know, McAllen, the quintessential storied Scotch whiskey, that if you went on their website, you would see uh, reference to, there, there, was, uh, there was a picture of their distillery their, their novel, uh, the, the new building that they just, uh, they just built. And the tagline front and center, uh, across the center of that page was um, where tradition meets innovation. And I thought that was really, really interesting that a brand like McAllen would, would even bother to call out innovation. You're actually starting to see a lot of brands um, across the spirits industry and, and even in wine, really trying to home in on what does innovation mean? How do we bring new things to people and do that in a way that still respects the traditional craft, right? Where do we, where do we merge those two? And that I think is, is the perhaps most fundamental feature of art itself, right? It's not where do I make something that's merely derivative of someone else's work, but where do I do something that is respectful and, and calls out uh, everyone that came before me, and also do something that is new and unique to uh, to to myself. And so I think it's it is both perfectly acceptable uh, and in fact really commonplace now uh, for for distillers uh, and for for spirits manufacturers and, and even in the wine industry 
for people to you know be open to what innovation means and, and for us you know technology is a really central component of it we wouldn't be able to do any of the things that we do without a really robust technology platform um, but you know at some level whether we call ourselves a spirits company that is very very heavily technology focused or technology focused uh, technology company that is very highly spirits focused that ultimately becomes about semantics we are about the two together no, it makes a ton of sense. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've noticed that with, with other industries as well as just the peppering yeah. in of innovation. Uh, sometimes it's kind of marketing gimmicky feeling, but others are kind of being true to that as well. Uh, and, yeah. and later I want to talk about kind of what I've seen in this particular industry using, you know, innovation and emerging technologies to help, uh, you know, build new and compelling products. But before we get there, what I would love to kind of double click on was another point that you'd made earlier around the process and yeah. condensing that process. It would be good to walk through uh, kind of at a high level, what's the traditional process for making whiskey? And then how have you reinvented that process? Sure. So there's in, in traditional whiskey making, you start with obviously the grain. Um, and depending on what kind of whiskey you're making, it could be very, you know, corn, barley, wheat, all, all kinds of different grains. Um, and those get ground up, uh, they get added to, to water, they add yeast, obviously this is pretty high level here, um, and they take that mash and they, they ferment it very much like you'd ferment a beer. Obviously, there's just there's no hops involved, and the grain combination is different. Uh, but you know, even that at the end of the day is it's called distiller's beer. So you know, it smells a lot like a brewery. It happens in a lot of the same kinds of tanks. You end up with something that is very similar to beer in its composition, uh, except instead of just taking that filtering and bottling it, you put it on a still and you boil it all off, um, and, and the still will basically collect the the alcohol. Um, and you don't want to distill it too many times. So you could theoretically just take that and distill it basically to purity, like something something like vodka, mm. um, really, really high alcohol. Um, and then you'd, you'd have something that is functionally flavorless. Um, but with whiskey, you really want to keep the essence of the grains that are in there. So you don't distill it too many times. You don't distill it to too high of, of, of its alcohol purity. And then you take that usually at about 165, 130 proof, you know, depending on how, how much you've actually distilled it, um, to 65% ABV or so. And then you will usually age that. You can buy things like white dog uh, that, that are unaged, but usually put that in a barrel. And that can be, you know, scotch will be in used bourbon barrels, bourbon will be in new charred oak barrels. Um, it, it really just depends on what, kind of flavor you want out of the oak right. but you'll get all of those things together um, and then you'll age them for some period of time and that's really where you know the that mash bill in terms of the grain and how much you distill it and what kind of oak you use and how long you age it and then how you rotate it inside of the rick house how you rotate the you know uh, different barrels into different locations and at the very end of it, how you blend it, all of that becomes part of the exercise of creating uh, you know, your own expression. Of whiskey. So what we're doing is, uh, has a lot of similar features on the front end in that uh, grain are still uh, a really efficient source of calories and calories are really important in terms of sugar calories for the production of alcohol. So primarily, will take corn derived alcohol, uh, except instead of keeping the essence of that corn whiskey, we have it distilled essentially to absolute purity. So we want all of our molecules to come to us basically completely pure, where the only contaminant, if you will, the only impurity might be water. And so- So you've we'll got that... essentially the blank canvas is what you're establishing. Exactly. So that's our blank canvas. Um, and then we're going to add on to it all these different molecules that we're extracting from various other places in nature. And now part of it is, I kind of skipped ahead here, 
because our, our first exercise really is to figure out what is whiskey in the first place, right? We have to, in some sort, in some sense, uh, the analogy I've used, if you wanna go down the, the painting and the canvas analogy is, you know, if you're asking us to paint a tree, we gotta look at a bunch of different trees to figure out what is a tree before we can paint our own. And so we have to go out and sample a lot of different whiskeys out there in the market, um, sample uh, old, in terms of our olfactory senses, but also in terms of uh, a pretty robust array of analytical chemistry uh, uh, piece of equipment. So and this so is we're going to point, I think, which yeah. is another kind of, I think, misconception is this isn't like a copy paste. This isn't like a replication of that's something right. that's existing. There is still a lot of art in the science here where you're actually saying, OK, I got a general sense of what the end picture looks like, the Picasso. Uh, however, I'm going to have my own take on that Picasso. It's not going to be a carbon copy of that. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And, you know, it's not as if the technology cannot do that. Um, we're, we're still we're still a ways from being able to create these these true facsimiles. Kind of the the analogy I'd use is we're we're not too far off from uh, the old the original Xerox analog Xerox machine, right? Where you can tell the copy from from the original. They're not quite the same, but now we we have digital copiers, and even they might not be perfectly identical, but they're really close. Um, and so we're, we're still a little bit far off from the ability to make true facsimiles that you wouldn't be able to distinguish. And that, that I think has really long-term implications for the purpose of archiving. Um, but even if we could do that now, we wouldn't do it, mostly because we know that consumers aren't really that interested in counterfeit. Like even if we could just make a true McAllen 18 copy, would you really be that interested in it as a McAllen 18 copy? Probably not. Right, because you know, just, just there, there is a market for people to buy posters of the Mona Lisa, but it's not nearly as robust as the demand to actually go see the original in person. You're you're giving me vivid kind of imagery here of you guys on a street corner in New York City saying, <laughs> "I've got your knockoff Gucci watch here." Right. Instead, it's exactly. a knockoff McKellen. <laughs> not much of a market. Exactly, exactly. You know, but but it is there, right? Some people they just want the image. Some people, they just want the flavor and they don't want anything else. Right. But, you know, we, we're fully aware that spirits is a holistic experience. Um, and, and so we're actually much more interested in, in being able to understand what is quintessentially whiskey or, you know, if you want to go down the hawking watches route, like what makes a really good Swiss watch. And then we want to make our own high quality watch. And, you know, look, like the, the Japanese watch uh, digital watch market decimated the swiss watch industry but today it's it's come back with with a completely uh reinvigorated sense uh, uh, of identity it, it's it's a shift right it's a move towards uh, even more artisanal high quality high price kind of uh uh essence of of what a swiss watch is but i think that that's okay right there there's there's a way to identify what really is the core competency of a Swiss watchmaker versus what's a digital watch, what function do they serve in the market, uh, and what value can they bring to consumers that, that we also want to recognize, right? Is That's the reason why we're not charging $150 a bottle for our product or $2,000 a bottle for our product, because we know at the end of the day, our thing is about creating something that is accessible for the masses, that everyone can say, I have something that works, it's really good, it's affordable, and when I really want to celebrate, you know, the birth of my kid or my sibling's wedding, you know, then I'm going to bring out the blue label or then I'm going to bring out the pappy. And that's perfectly OK. So, you know, we you know, coming back to coming back to the process is we're trying to figure out then what, what does a tree look like? What is the molecular composition of whiskeys out in the market? What makes a Japanese whiskey different from a wheat and bourbon? different from you know, a peated scotch, and even within those categories, what makes, the different, uh, what makes the different ages, what makes the different distilleries different from each other. 
um, what makes them similar, what makes them different. And then we've come back to now our blank canvas and we have to make decisions, human decisions about what is it that we actually want to make? What is the thing worth making as, for example, a first part or, or a second or, or a portfolio? And so that's when we're sort of bringing in the, uh, the human creativity element of, uh, I understand from a digital perspective what this is supposed to look like. I understand you know, the, the different features of, of, these, of these products, but I want to figure out um, what is uniquely my, my own expression. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. And, you know, it, it almost makes me think of less of chemistry and more kind of, uh, I think of kind of alchemy, you know, because there is a bit of kind of an art behind this. Uh, and yes, there's a lot of science behind trying to do this. But there's, you know, like you said, there's still very much this kind of assembly of, of uh, kind of your expression of what you feel that this should look like as a yeah. product. Absolutely. And so um, I was going to bring this up later, but I think this is a good time to bring it up now um, as we're talking about kind of the personalization of this. Uh, one, of, one, of, one of my clients that, that we had been working with was uh, uh, McNamara Distilleries um, out in Europe. And uh, they've been known to innovate. They've been around for, I think, 200 years. Uh, they keep their all their barrels in a in a old abandoned mine shaft, as an example, to give you some some vivid yeah. imagery here. Um, and they were using things like artificial intelligence to yeah. essentially map what are all the different permutations that you as an individual like, and try to map that to essentially a personalized whiskey for you individually. So not something that would be kind of mass produced as a product, but this would be, you know, Alec Lee's version of, 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 of whiskey. Uh, this would be Mike Walker's version of what he likes and his specific dials and configurations. Um, you know, they, they had a couple award-winning whiskeys where it was kind of more general purpose, but yeah. how far off do you think we are to something like that, where, you know, you as an individual with your own palate could, essentially customize your own uh, whiskey experience? Well, we can do that now. So we actually have uh, a, a pretty now robust platform where we're working directly with distributors and, and with retailers. And we can kind of tell them, you know, here's your blank canvas. Here are your, here are the colors, your, your paints. You know, go paint, right? figure out, and, and it doesn't look too different from the blending of a whiskey uh, or different whiskeys, blending of different barrels, but it is, so, so fundamentally it's a similar process, but it's a lot more robust in terms of the, uh, the, the breadth of the, uh, the breadth of, of the types of flavors that you can get, you know, the, the, the modifications that you can make. And so, um, we could do that now, but that's where we become, that, that's where we sort of get our hands tied with a lot of the regulatory issues, right? Is, you know, a critical feature of the alcohol industry in the U.S. is that spirits manufacturers cannot sell direct to consumer. You know, even when you go into a tasting room and you buy bottles off of their shelves, most of the time, you're not actually buying it from them directly. We have a third party retailer who just sort of sets up shop in their distillery because we have to create these firewalls of retail from, from manufacturers. Um, it's different from a tasting room, uh, but even then, you know, it, 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 there, there's just like, it, it's so restricted. So you, Mike Walker, you couldn't call us up and say, here's the design I want, make it for me and sell it to me directly. But then I'd have to sell it to a distributor. The distributor would have to sell it to a retailer. And then you buy it from the retailer. So if you're willing to pay, you know, thousand dollars a bottle, I'm sure that the chain, the, the you know, the, the distribution chain would be willing to make that work. Um, but the, the, you know, uh, unfortunately, that becomes a lot more challenging than designing your own Nike shoe, because Nike is allowed to sell to you directly if you want. But even when you design your own shoe, it's going to cost you a lot more than when you go to the store, and that's right. part of the part of the challenge. So if I heard you correctly. The only thing really stopping us is uh, the 
lack of disintermediation in the whole business world of having all these different third parties that's just going to completely jack up the prices and make it just unrealistic for the consumers. That's right. I mean, I think that we we could end up in a in a world where you can have a 3D printer for your for your beverages and, and I know there there are companies that are working on that. There's even like now Keurigs for cocktails and things of that nature. But I think really if you want true customization you're gonna have to wait for the Star Trek replicator. <laughs> yeah, I would love to be able uh, to have a situation where, uh, you know, Endless West, they send me a, a kit that's very similar to like a uh, like a Viome or a 23andMe type of scenario where I yeah. got my kit. And instead of taking blood or swabbing my mouth, it's I've got kind of this uh, easy way for me to discover uh, what my palette is and I send it to you guys and you go, Oh, well, you know, we can create that from our blank canvas and, and here you go. Right. Here's your customized version. That would be phenomenal. That would be awesome. But, uh, not realistic today. Uh, legally, uh, it sounds like one day, one day. One day. Nice. So, so another subtlety of some of the, some of the kind of descriptions that you've uh, provided is you've used terms like, uh, note by note. And when, yeah. when you say that phrase, uh, what do you mean by that? I, I would say note by note is to some extent interchangeable with the concept of molecular in okay. that, in that you could swap it out for molecule by molecule, where we make a choice about each individual molecule that gets added the amount of it gets added, you know, what molecule it is, the amount that gets added, uh, you know, it, its ratios and its synergies with other molecules. And that defines or helps in some cases define the different notes, the, the flavor notes and the aroma notes of, uh, of a particular whiskey. So, you know, it, it's not unfortunately as simple as doing a, a drawing a direct line. Each molecule corresponds to a particular flavor. Otherwise, you wouldn't need very many molecules. And in many cases, we're having to work with hundreds of different molecules. But the combination of various molecules in certain ratios may give you only one flavor note. And so I guess it's it, it, in some sense a, a dual meaning, right? It's a little bit of designing those flavor notes one at a time uh, and all together, uh, but also the individual molecules one at a time, but also together. So I'm curious. So uh, as you're describing, you know, the molecules and you've got the blank canvas and you're sourcing from all natural ingredients, uh, it makes me wonder um, about what what are kind of the source things that you're pulling from? Like, you know, are you pulling from uh, weird uh, rainforest uh, vegetables or insects or trees or what have you, or or apples or oranges or what have you? I guess, uh, sure. what are some examples of some of those things that you're sourcing these molecules from? And then I'm going to add one other twist to it, which is what is kind of, uh, kind of one ingredient that would maybe surprise us that would be in it or is kind of strange or weird? Oh, that one's going to be a lot tougher. I'll have to think about that. Um, but in, in terms of the sources for, for the components, um, you know, the most basic and easiest one uh, would be, you know, the sugars, right? The sugars and the alcohol. It's not too hard to intuit where those come from. You know, the alcohol is distilled from also from grain or from pretty much any other sugars. There are very trace amounts of uh, sugars that you'll find in whiskeys, much more so in wine. Uh, and those will be, you know, coming from cane, corn, really a, a whatever uh, efficient agricultural feedstock we can get from. Um, in other cases, as I mentioned, the color comes directly from, from wood. And so we are extracting certain molecules that we can't otherwise source commercially from wood directly. And we extract that, uh, as I mentioned, overnight. Um, where the story becomes, I think, a lot perhaps less intuitive, somewhat intuitive, but a lot more interesting and diverse is in the flavor molecules themselves. These are, these are a lot of small molecules that contribute to aroma. And you know, a lot of them actually end up coming from fermentation byproducts. Um, so 
you know, uh, I can tell you one interesting story. I guess there, there's sort of two interesting stories on that front. One would be um, the, the concept of natural vanilla is, is actually really interesting. Um, natural vanilla does not have to come from a vanilla bean, uh, not, not just for us, but you know, per, per the FDA definitions. Um, so natural vanilla just means one of an approved set of uh, methods of making, or, or in this case, getting yeast to ferment uh, this particular molecule, uh, largely vanillin, um, which you know, is the primary uh, contributor of the smell and, and the, uh, the, the flavor of vanilla. So uh, there, there are engineered yeasts that can simply be grown and you extract that molecule. And as long as it's in this sort of pre-prescribed process, uh, you can extract it and that's considered natural vanilla. Uh, you can also get natural vanilla from uh, extracts of wood. Uh, vanillin is uh, very present in wood, uh, sometimes as an individual molecule, which is why, you know, especially like fresh uh, oak can, have this almost, or if you go to a rick house, you can almost get some of these vanilla type notes. A lot of those come out into whiskey from the wood directly. Um, but sometimes they're also uh, in, in, in sort of like they're polymerized. You can break apart those polymers and you can get uh, those vanillin, uh, vanillin molecules. And so that would be another way. And then the third way, of course, is just to get the vanilla, vanilla beans, right? But vanilla beans, are absurdly expensive, right? Like the, the ex natural vanilla extract uh, from vanilla beans is on the order of uh, a few hundred thousand dollars a ton. And that's just not practical for, you know, for, for wide scale, uh, for, it's not practical to meet the demand the vanilla has. And so uh, uh, artificial vanilla, or that is vanilla that, that doesn't, come from anything having to do with a vanilla bean is about 98% of the global uh, vanilla market. We happen not to use that. We still have to derive, we, but, but we don't necessarily get it from a vanilla bean directly. We can get it from wood. We can get it from, from yeast. So that would sort of be, be one category um, of, of sort of like an interesting story about, about this, this market of, of some of these small molecules. And, and I guess another would be, you know, as with, with any wine, right, what, what fundamentally defines it uh, as, as being different from a sensory perspective from, let's say, juice, grape juice versus wine, is, of course, the, the alcohol and the, the complexity of some of the, let's, uh, let's call them fungi notes, right. right? There's a little bit more funk in that versus like uh, just a straight up juice. And a lot of that is, of course, because the yeast are coming in, they're breaking down a lot of these molecules, they're making, in some case, you know, the alcohol for them is a waste product. Uh, they're making you know, waste products from the breakdown of some of these molecules. And the molecules that contribute to some of this funk are the same molecules you might find in um, vomit, in some cases, or human sweat, uh, or, you know, uh, so for a really good example of one is, is a molecule called butyric acid that is in the smell of cheese, it's in the smell of a lot of wines, and it's in the smell of human feet. Uh, and it's just because these microbes are like growing there, uh, which is why like some cheeses smell like feet, right? And vice right. versa. Um, and, and it's because you have these molecules, uh, sorry, the, these microorganisms that are growing in your feet, um, that just sort of our natural part of our flora that break down, you know, they're, they're feeding off of the byproducts from our body and that make some of these molecules. And yeah, it's kind of a gross story, but like, it's also just part of the natural environment that we live in. Like we eat things in nature, we die and then we get consumed by things in nature and, you know, everything kind of gets recycled in that way. Right. So um, I, I, would have, I, I would sort of lay as, as, as a foundation here Nothing that we uh, that we use is derived from animals, um, and nothing that we use is uh, synthetic. And, and for, it's also interesting that for the purposes of FDA labeling, if you use bacteria to make something, to make a flavor molecule, it's considered artificial. If you use a yeast to do it, 
it's considered natural. Why? You know, again, someone lobbied for some distinction at some point in, in, in the past, right? But um, many of these molecules are essentially farmed in really large scale by various fungi, various yeasts, and then and then extracted. Um, and so that uh, that that definitely ends up being a large source for for many molecules, just because it's a, it's a really efficient way to get some of these high value components. And that way, you don't have to go into the rainforest and raise it to get some of these like really rare molecules. That way, you don't have to kill animals to get some of these molecules. Right. So everything is either plant or yeast derived in in our product. So uh, I want to be very respectful of your time because I could go on all day and talk about this sure. stuff. This is super, super fascinating. Um, but I, I want to get to uh, one of the last questions I have for you, uh, Alec, is um, I guess, what do you think over the next five to 10 years, you know, what do you think your influence is going to be on the industry? Where do you think it's going to go uh, it, down this, this thread of molecular based spirits? That's, that's a really interesting question. Um, we're seeing a big trend historically, probably over, largely over the last 20 years, of premiumization in the industry. And I think that's been reasonably well coupled with the trend in the food industry, uh, as we talked about at the beginning, of uh, people going towards whole ingredient, natural, you know, just the general movement of what organic means to, to people generally, which ends up being a misnomer. Um, but I, I'd like to think that we'll play an important part in this ecosystem of other companies like Impossible Foods um, or you know, NotCo that are really just sort of changing the game of how consumers think about what engineering in food, in food means. And the reason why I'd like to think that we're going to play a pivotal, pivotal role in that is because it's one thing to look at you know, engineered milk or meat and, under, and sort of connect the dots of, well, there's a lot of cows and cows are really bad for the environment. And so if we reduce the number of cows, then we'll you know, help save the environment. But I think there's another feature of that, which is not just the, you know, have we made something, some functionally equivalent stable, um, perhaps, you know, the analogy here might be, have we just made a Nissan Leaf? That, you know, I have nothing against a Nissan Leaf, right? But it, just, it gets you from point A to point B. Right. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't excite you the way that a sports car would. But Teslas excite people. And I think that there's, there's an argument, there's a really compelling argument to be made that for us to really get consumers over the hump in, in a widespread way, you can't just make the staple. You can't just prove that you can make a burger equivalent to a cow burger. There's a lot of value in that, right? Just like there's a lot of value in Nissan Leaf, a lot of value in the Model 3, a lot of value in like consumer, uh, cons you know, mass cons uh, consumer price uh, electric cars. But there's also really inherent value in our collective understanding, our collective now knowledge that electric cars aren't just there to get us from point A to point B, but they can actually outperform their ICE counterparts, right? And in a similar way, we want to be able to show that in those areas of food and beverage, where we care in, in many cases more deeply about them than pretty much any other food or beverage. You know, there are wine competitions and whiskey competitions happening pretty much every single week for a reason. I don't know if I've ever heard of an egg competition or like a milk competition in the same way, right? Um, that those things can also be done with this food technology framework and that collectively, they all bring a great deal of value to sustainability, to accessibility, quality. Uh, and, and so I'd, I'd like to believe that over the next five to 10 years, you know, we'll, we'll have a number of products out in the market it will have widespread access and widespread claim um, that are fundamentally built on on this technology values. Yeah, that's that's super super fascinating. And you know what I'm taking away from this, and in my own words, uh, I will build on a couple of the things that you said. I think one, 
um, to really expand upon, you had meant, you you had said words like um, uh, uh, a platform. And I think, you know, things like your product on kind of the approaches and methods that you're using. Uh, if we go back to that iTunes analogy, you know, what, what has made iTunes successful uh, isn't necessarily the act of digitizing music. It was the act of creating a platform where the value exchange could be amplified not only for the musicians and the, the labels and, and yeah. the, the, the distributor, in this case, Apple, uh, but it provides you know, a level playing field, a level of disintermediation, uh, but also a, a way to what you pointed out to create differentiation in products and make it unique and special. And so, you know, uh, uh, hopefully I'm not uh, giving anything away uh, 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 from a strategy perspective, but kind of how I look at this is I would love to see, you know, s someone like you guys to be able to offer a platform for people to go and build their own uh, spirit app store where, you know, you guys got the technology, you guys can fabricate all this great stuff. And really, you know, it's crowdsourcing the spirit innovation, right? That would be super, super cool. And, you know, a, a potentially kind of a, a groundbreaking idea over the next uh, uh, five to 10 years. Uh, so I think that's cool. And we could talk for hours about that. Um, two, we, we highlighted it in multiple points in the conversation, but sustainability is super important. I mean, you've got big companies like ours, uh, like Microsoft, where we've ma been making huge, huge investments in this area and big commitments to uh, uh, to be carbon negative and also to uh, go all the way back to 77, uh, 1977 and, and, you know, be that far negative. So it's uh, there's a lot there, uh, again, to unpack. But I think consumers care about that more now than they ever have before and being able to Absolutely. demonstrate hey, there is a lot of waste in the process. We can eliminate all that waste, I think is phenomenal. And then yeah. third, I had it on the tip of my tongue uh, that, that you had brought up, but uh, I think at least, oh, I know what it was. In, in my mind, I think for folks, consumers uh, like myself, I'll admit I'm in this category where I read the labels. And if there's a word I can't pronounce on a label, I get a little concerned and I want to, you know, you know, open my phone and Google, what the heck is this? Right. And, you know, being able to create a product where, you know, you understand what's in it, it's controlled, there's a process around it. I think that's going to be super compelling to consumers. And you may even ch change the game in a big way when it comes to spirits, just kind of my observations. I'd like to think so. Well, listen, Alec, uh, it's been phenomenal talking to you. Um, and if people want to get a hold of you, what is the best way to get a hold of you? So obviously they can come to our website at endlesswest.com. Uh, and I'm reachable directly just at alec at endlesswest.com. Perfect. All right, Alec, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Super interesting conversation. Thanks for having me. This is really fun. All right. Bye guys. You to this and you know, broke up the conversation in multiple parts. Uh, did that appeal to you? Uh, do you want to see more of that or less of it? You know, definitely let us know in the comments, uh, you know, and provide whatever feedback as well. If you want, you know, more of a particular topic or less of a particular topic, uh, would definitely love to hear from all of you. So with that, we'll see you next time.